Why, hello, and welcome back to Watches Live. Today we are discussing a few of my favorite things, starting with the biggest prize of all. That's right, I have a real, honest-to-God, monoblock case 3700 Nautilus on the table. The first one I've seen in 3,000 watch videos or broadcasts. This is a special occasion. Naturally, that's why I'm going to open with a different Zenith, the DayFi Classic. You guys have seen some of the novelties from 2018, and you may wonder why open with the Classic, because right now this is the most relevant full bracelet watch. And I'm going to tease another blue dial piece in the background. But this is the most relevant full bracelet watch in the entire LVMH catalog. Why? Because Bulgari is still too niche. Tag Heuer just isn't going to give the company the horological credibility. And Hublot, I kind of feel like Hublot has reached peak Hublot and we're past it. This is the future of LVMH watchmaking. Titanium grade 5, 41 millimeters, solid dial, not one of those open arrow jobs. Wonderfully silky, faceted, polished, satin, all of it in a single Zenith heritage-inspired form that I'm going to throw on my wrist right now. By the way, guys, let me greet you as you come in. I can see right here we have Russell 996, Simon Holt, Eddie Landsberg, Fjord Prethic, Watch, Joda, JBO, Surf, Selubin, Steve Pless, Andrew, ST12. Guys, welcome. Okay, so let's talk about how this watch fits because I think this is the most interesting Zenith of the year. And yes, that's an interesting watch in a year when Zenith launched the DayFi Zero G. It looks like a Zenith. It wears like a Zenith. It doesn't feel like it's spliced DNA from any other branch of the LVMH empire. For me, this has got to be the face of the brand. As the El Primero ages, and frankly, the crossbreeding with Hublot and Tag is not quite working out, something like this needs to save the ship. It looks good. It feels good. It's 11 millimeters thick, and at 100 meters water resistant, this is a watch anyone can wear with pride. It's only 45.5 millimeters lug to lug, which means any wrist can pop this one on. Down to 13 and a half centimeters, you're looking at my 16 centimeter wrist right here. This is my favorite new Zenith of the year. Yes, a three-hand date. That said, I love me some complications. And before we jump to that hardcore paddock, I want to show you guys something that I adore. Now, this came out in 2012, and it's generally seen on an aviator-style strap. So I wanted to show you the Pilot Double Matic in all of its glory on a rarely seen Zenith factory vulcanized rubber job. Okay, 45 millimeters stainless steel, what are we looking at? We're looking at world time, a grand date with a quick set, an alarm with an on-off function, and a variable geometry animated power reserve. What does that mean? Well, in practical terms, it means the power reserve moves and changes color as well as size. So let me set this one up. We're going to enjoy the festivities. It turns from green to red as it circles the dial. and you've got the on-off, so you can actually deactivate the system when you don't want it. So what do you get? You get a power reserve, an on-off, you get a grand date, you get a world time complication, you get a high beat El Primero, and you get it all on a watch that wears a heck of a lot more compact than 45 millimeters. Let me show you why I love this watch, because this is literally the most complication you can buy for the money. Forget Audemars Piguet, forget Patek Philippe, F.P. Journe. This is the way to go. It's a mainstream brand that can service the product forever. Zenith's been around since 1865, and they're going to be around long after their 200th anniversary. This is one you can wear for 10, 20, 30 years and still find that one of these complications, the alarm, the world time, the date, or the chronograph, will serve you every day of your life. And in steel, you could wear it with anything. Even on my baby wrist, this one looks just fine. I'd say you could wear this on a wrist as small as 14. Okay, guys. Join in from around the world. I can see Rasmus joining us from Sweden and Longmac all the way from Denmark. HH, Haute Orlogerie, joining us. Sorry, I lost... Lost the thread there. This live chat is jumping quickly from Holland, Amsterdam. And I can see Sinvo. Hi, Tim. Finally managed to catch the live show. Welcome, Steve Plus. It's a Zenith North flag. You know, the Day 5 does have a little bit of that, but if you look back to the original Zenith A384, you're going to see where that case design came from. It's not a North flag. It's very Zenith. You just got to turn the page back a few decades to see where it came from. All right. I teased you. Now 
I have to deliver. I told you we have a Patek 3700. The original Nautilus, as Genta invented it, yes, invented it. This watch features the original 1976 patent. We can, there we go, our macro camera. The original 1976 patent was for a monoblock case, which is to say, the flank of the case features a junction between the bezel and the steel, and here, thanks to the two-tone, you can see that with exquisite detail, but as you get close, you can see where the bezel is actually clamped down to the case. You can see the gasket between the bezel and the case, and if you look at the case back, it appears at first glance to be a case back, but it's not. It's all milled from the same piece of stainless steel, which means that this extraordinary watch is a front loader. The dial and the movement go in from the front, and they come out from the front when it's serviced. Now, the original patent was for a two-part case, bezel and the monoblock, and that's what you get here. This 3700 was one of the very last made, which is why it has no Sigma dial, as that lapsed in about 1999. It features Patek Philippe maker's marks on the bracelet, not an after market bracelet specialist, and if you look at the bracelet itself, it features ceramic spring-loaded pin snaps. This watch, by my estimation, was made sometime between about 2001 and 2005, when production of the original Nautilus actually ended, superseded by the 30th anniversary 5711 with its three-part case. Now, you'll note another distinctive feature of the 3700, the original Jumbo, the fact that there is no center seconds. This is as elemental as it gets, and what's the advantage of lacking the display case back in the center seconds? A slim profile. This is 7.4 millimeters thick compared to 8.1 for the 5711. More than that, only about 1,500 to 2,000 of these in two-tone were made from 1976 to 2005, and they're not making any more. Inside the Geneva Hallmark 19,800 beat rate, JLC 920 doing business as the Geneva seal finished, Patek Philippe 28255, 2.55 millimeters thick. This is old school. This is as good as it gets, and because it was one of the last made, it even features a still-functional Luminova dial. And yes, all of the removable links are fixed by screws, not pin sleeves. Is this watch the total package? Yes, it is. Is it my favorite watch on the table tonight? It's between this and the Zenith. That said, my favorite color on the table tonight comes from another Johnny Come Lately House of Boutique Horology. It's not Zenith, it's not Patek, it's not any company making more than 5,000 watches a year. In this case, it's a remarkably evocative Richard Mille RM1102. So let's quickly inventory the features of this frankly insane watch. Okay, so if you're clinically nuts, this will look great on your wrist. In 2007, Richard Mill launched the RM11, a watch that became the signature of the brand. A tonneau case made by Valjean with a base caliber by Vauché and a module from Dubois de Praz. That's a rather uncharitable assessment. Let's talk a little bit more sympathetically. This is something that is instantly iconic on the wrist and offers real world functionality. It's water resistant, it's shock resistant. It features raft isolation with Four elastomers, and you can see where the movement in grade five titanium is bolted to the case. Those four bolts feature rubber shock absorbers to absorb the shock. The movement itself with minimal sprung mass, only about 25 grams. Now here's the thing, there's a lot more going on with the RM1102 from 2014, namely a second time zone. So you have that 24 hour second time zone for far flung friends, family, and business associates, but you maintain the flyback chronograph functionality, the ability to reset and restart with a push. Now here's where the watch differentiates itself from the mass of flybacks. We can get real close to the dial, you'll be able to see that the chronograph hours register is in a 24 hour format, meaning you have a 24 hour format second time zone, you have 12 hour format at center, and yes, it's been mooted that you could use this as a third time zone if you started at the right time. That is absolutely true. Now what else have you got? You've got an annual calendar. Let me move the hands out of the way. Second time zone out of the way, local time, skedaddle. Now you can see that there's a double digit grand date somewhat preposterously surrounded by slash marks in red, but you have the date and you have the month at 4.30. With those two indications, you have an annual calendar that requires adjustment only once per year, the jump from February to March. With an original retail price of $160,000, this is some pretty heavy duty hardware, but then again, it does make high horology easy. It's made of rose gold and it's made of titanium. 
How do we know? Because it says titanium on the side. How do we know it has a flyback chronograph? Because it says flyback right on the chronograph trigger. How do we know how to start and stop it? Because it says so on the start stop trigger. High horology made simple, or I should say, complications for dummies. This is the Richard Mill RM1102. And by the way, it wears easily on a small wrist. It's less than 50 millimeters lug to lug, and it's basically shaped like a loop. When you take the bracelet, or I should say the strap and the case form into account, you have an electric combination of titanium, red gold, and neon green. Do I like? Well, I certainly like the complication, I like the ergonomics, and I like the green, but if you're a rose gold kind of guy, this thing would look the business on the top deck of your mega yacht at the Monaco Grand Prix next year. You can send your thank you note by private jet. Okay, right now, dub plate melter, no Brian. Brian is on the Wednesday show on the other channel. This is Watches Live, the only show we air here on Watchbox Reviews. I can also see, bum, 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 bum. We have some friends joining us from Singapore. Interesting, guys, thank you for getting up early to be with me. Chang, I really appreciate that. And I have a question from FFGG KPZ. Am I looking for an intern? I am always looking for an intern. Monday mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Send me your applications. And I can see right here, Todd saying, sweet ass. Zenith, that is a fact. Jumbo Jet Pilot, nice Nautilus, but I'd love it if the dial disc printing and indices matched the pink gold rather than white. Well, the Nautilus does actually feature color keyed dial. I'm going to jump right back to that real quick. The 3700 features a a yellow gold surround. It is a yellow gold in steel watch, and it features matching yellow gold hands and indices. So everything does line up, but this one yellow rather than rose. And frankly, I should put this one on the wrist because this is the star of the whole episode. And the nice thing about this watch is that it's only 44 0.5 millimeters from lug to lug. And even on a tiny wrist, it looks perfect. It fits perfectly. The, the profile of this watch has never found a cuff it didn't like. It'll slide underneath anything, even as it's still a sports watch, 120 meters, rain or shine. Despite being thin, this is one you can absolutely get wet. Luminova dial, auto winding. Don't let the two-tone fool you. This one's for all seasons. Okay, now let's talk about something that is frankly nuts. I have Amro always keeping me honest, asking when the ball watch right now. Okay, tonight we're talking about the ball. Hydrocarbon Engineer Space Master. It looks bigger than it is. It's actually a 41 millimeter watch. The thickness though is where it sets itself apart. At 16.4, this one has never met a cuff it liked, but it is overbuilt in a way that I find wonderfully endearing. First, the dial, if we can get close. The dial is composed of 29 micro tubes. They are glass and filled with a tritium gas. They're called tracers. They're made by a company called H3, and appropriately enough, they're full of tritium. That's right. H3 is self-activating loom, meaning if you put this watch in a dive locker for 10 years, you're going to pull it out, it's still going to be glowing. 29 individual tracers, and here's the good news. It can't become atmospheric because it's fully contained, unlike old tritium or radium print, and because it has a half-life of about 12 and a half years, yes, Ball can service it by just replacing the tracers. Now, the watch has a unidirectional bezel and a wonderfully quirky depth rating of 333 meters or 1,100 feet. I adore that. I don't understand why, but I adore it. Now, it also has a wonderfully high 15,000 ampere per meter anti-magnetic protection. So the ISO standard 764 for an anti-magnetic watch is 4,800 ampere per meter. This one's over 15,000. You see, not one, but two screws fixing each side of the bracelet. And the bracelet itself is descended from a Mossler vault. Take a look at the bracelet. It features two incremental adjustment systems, one on each side. So you have the ability to open one or both. Each one is equivalent to one full removable link. So you can effectively add or subtract two removable links by using the micro adjustment system located in both sides of the clasp. You want more, you got it. One of the strangest crown guard structures I've ever encountered. You actually pull a pin and then you displace the crown guard and it has all aspect protection like the Panerai system. It's just a little bit easier to use. Now here's, here's the trade-off. It's also a screw down crown system. So you do have to screw it out unlike the Panerai Luminor, but you get the same level of protection with maybe a little bit more theater built in. If you're a man who likes to show off and make horological friends with features and functions, this watch is perfect for you. 
anti-magnetic, water resistant, also 7200G shock resistant. Ball is not shy about advertising the resilience of this timepiece. And if you are, in fact, an engineer, a hydrocarbon explorer, or a spacefarer, this is the watch for you from Ball. Again, not a huge watch. I'll put it on my wrist. You can see it, you expect it to be huge. It's technically a 41, and I can wear it on 16 cm. I think down to about 14, you're going to be okay with this. If you don't want to wear a Panerai Luminor and you want something that's even more left field than a Bremont ball. But I do have a Bremont on the table tonight. Before we talk about it, let's talk about something that's beyond the pale. Absolutely gorgeous. Platinum, Torbion, Perpetual Calendar, and Jaeger LeCoultre. Back in 2009, this thing was the flagship. When the Master Grand Tradition line bowed, this was one of the inaugural models. 42 millimeters in platinum, PT950, extra white. It is a combination of a Torbion with a gorgeous open lower dial. What you see at the bottom with the pyramid imprint is actually part of the movement. Only the upper two-thirds of the dial are actually dial. Everything you see below the words tourbillon and perpetual is a functional component of the bridges and plates of the caliber. Now, th there's an overcoil for the hairspring. It beats away at four hertz. It is a one-minute tourbillon, but you also have, and you can see the adjustment system on the flank, the Kurt Claus coordinated perpetual calendar system on a ruthenium coated dial with white gold Dauphine hands and white gold dark style indices. Now everything is mechanically programmed, so you just adjust the date and the day, the moon phase, the year, the decade, even the month, all of them move in sync, so you cannot accidentally invent a day-date-month-moon combination. There's no math involved. If you can set a three-hand Rolex with a date, you can set this thing. Now, I will mention, it's got a gorgeous case back. The dial is where the action is, but you can see the handsome 22-carat mass in an era when we're seeing more and more 21-carat, 18-carat, or even tungsten carbide on $100,000 watches. This is refreshing. Ceramic bearings, unidirectional winder, 48-hour reserve, but it's the double-crested Cote de Soleil. You can see it's not one, it's two Cote de Genève superimposed. If we can get really close here, you can see it, but it's a double-crested sunburst system of Cote de Genève radiating out from the balance bridge. You'll also note a micro perlage across the base plate itself. This one is a supernova in broad daylight. And you can see that dial, metallic, bi-level, ruthenium coated. And this is the advantage of that open lower dial. You can see everything inside the tourbillon assembly. You'll even note there's a black polished, continuously rounded bridge. This is as good as it gets for JLC finish and watchmaking. Tim, what do you think of Voodoo watches, and what's the chance of having one of Carrie's pieces on the show? I'd say the chances are good. We've had just about everything over the years, literally everything. I like his watches. I think the 28's a nice piece in its most elemental form. You get a cool, oversized balance, a big, open, and visible movement. You get his distinctive lugs. You get his in-house dials. He actually owns his own dial factory, and a unique double-direct impulse escapement system that's still considered cutting edge in the industry, but it's the attention to detail. It's that which you don't see at the macro level. When you put a carry watch on your wrist, you're actually losing the advantage of the case back, and you really need to own a 10 to 20 power loop to appreciate the extent of what he's offered. From an arm's length, it could be any off-brand watch from an FP Journe or a Laurent Ferrier. When you get close, that's where it sets itself apart. All right, lots of friends joining us tonight. I can see JBO Surf saying that thing is, is a beast. Hell Bop, late again. Martin Newton, I crumb. You know, Hell Bop, I don't blame you for being late, and I'm going to reward you for your fidelity to the show with something truly special. Let's talk. Let's talk Patek Philippe. Let's go from Nautilus, from the depths of the seas to the height of the heavens. This is the 2015 Patek Philippe. 5102P. Let me see if I can get the light to hit it at the right angle, because you really need the benefit of good lighting and the right angle to appreciate this star chart. You get one lunation, you get a date, you get sidereal time, you get a star chart in the northern hemisphere as seen from Geneva. Here's what you're looking at. You're looking at three separate discs. The bottom one provides that gorgeous metallic blue. Let's see if we can get that. There we go. Perfect. Good focus. The bottom one provides that gorgeous metallic blue. The second one 
produces the moon, which not only migrates around the dial, it also changes phase in real time. Now, what you see in the aperture at the top of the dial is, in fact, the stars as you will see them in the northern hemisphere. The last of the disks underneath the dial features the image of the Milky Way, that is, all of the stars in the cosmos. So all of those celestial bodies move simultaneously. The difference between the 2002 5102 and the 2015 6102 is the presence of this large radial date and some dimensions of the case. Now I'm going to quickly engage this monster so you can actually see how it works because you deserve a little bit more than a description. You need to see. Okay. So I'm going to grab my polishing cloth, clean off that crystal because fingers, and now we're going to see what this watch actually does in motion. Let me get the angle right. This is what you see if you're fortunate enough to own the watch. You see the continuous action of the cosmos through that star chart aperture. And when one star crosses a meridian once and then again, that is one sidereal day. Now, in the opposite direction, you can see that the moon moves while changing phase in real time. So you get both. And then, of course, there's that radial date with the lunette indicator. You'll also note that the flanks of the watch, immaculate and resplendent in platinum with the top Wesselton diamond between the lugs at 6 o'clock. Platinum Patek Philippe, celestial complication. And yes, this was originally an application piece. Terry Stern himself had to sign off on the sale. You can be the owner with nothing more than my blessing which you'll obviously receive. Okay guys, let's talk about something that is way down market, but just as blue and just as cool, and perhaps just as rare. Now if you know Revolution, you know that it's the only watch magazine that's still worth reading. We love watch time, I like them a lot, but my favorite is Revolution. Now there's also the Rake, founded by the same Waco, a men's style mag to go with the wristwatch mag, and the combination of the two in the last year produced this 100 piece series. This is the Tag Heuer Carrera Revolution plus the Rake limited edition of 100. A couple of things set this apart, for example, from the Skipper for Hodinkee. First, this one has a balanced dial with no date. Second, this one, a 100 piece series, is inspired by Waco Revolution founder, and his favorite color. So he loves blue. Kind of Blue is his favorite album, and he feels that overall the balance of the dial and the shades of blue, not the one, not the two, but the three or more really makes the composition, of course, in tandem with those strong faceted traditional Carrera lugs. Box section sapphire, not flat, not domed, box section, the most expensive. And because they eliminated the date, they created a potential dead spot. In the intermediate position, this watch would have a freewheeling crown. Tag Heuer eliminated the dead spot when it eliminated the date by request of Waco. Now, you also get to see that for which you've paid, Tag Heuer caliber 18, but all of the action, and I will actually show you something cool here, all of the action is on the dial side of the watch. Where you'll note it is a glorious blue mat, 39 millimeters in diameter, and it comes with two straps. There's this perforated navy blue period piece in leather, and there's another one that's a NATO strap in textile. A gorgeous watch on the wrist. This thing looks the business and feels it. I approve for wrists as small as 13 and a half centimeters circumference, but it'll work with just about any attire and properly for a watch that's more than a little nautically themed, 100 meters water resistant. I love that watch. Okay, right here I can see Daniel Chapman joining in, the boss of Hunt Club coming in. I can see we've got friends from Sutat, a longtime viewer, Mark S. saying he loves that tag, and the boss saying, I was looking at Spring Drives and Omega Seamaster Railmasters. Mm, okay, let me know, which one would you prefer? I'll give you my opinion, I go with Spring Drive. As much as I love the Railmaster, Spring Drive is something unique. But here's the thing, Spring Drive is a movement, the Railmaster is a model. So you gotta pick a case for your Spring Drive. Let me know what you got in mind and I'll throw in my two cents. Okay. Tim, did they make that tag with a black dial? No, that's a piece exclusively for Revolution and the Rake, right down to the movement engineering, which is specific to them too. 
All right, bump, bump, bump. Alexi Simola of Finland saying, make mine a Hoyer 2444 pre Carrera, nicer movement. And then Sutat saying, how much is that tag? I forgot to mention, all of this is for sale, guys. Well, you're in luck because for once I've actually got pricing. That watch is, wow, we're asking 9,000. That's a watch that's held its value rather remarkably. I can't tell you I'll see another one. We've had one. I'm guessing we'll have one. If you want it, you know where to find it, and now you know the price. That said, you do have other options in the sports watch segment, and I'm going to throw out a friend from a brand I absolutely adore, a brand I think you guys love as well, Zinn Uhren. Zinn Special Uhren of Frankfurt in 1997 gave us the original EZM-1, the original Mission Timer, that one was of titanium and 40 millimeters. For 2017, the mission timer is back. 500 pieces, integumented, basically indelible steel. I've never seen a scratch or scuff on tegumented steel. It's basically a culsterizing process whereby the face of the steel is hardened. And in my experience, it has the scratch resistance of ceramic without any of the fracture risk. Now, there's a lot more going on here. You have a captured bezel whereby you can see the bezel is actually held on by screws, so you can't snap it off like you can a Rolex or Omega Seamaster bezel. This one has to be removed by first removing the screws. Yes, it's a lefty, or as Panerai would say, a destro. You have opposite side crown and chronograph pushers because that simply makes more functional sense. When it's on your wrist, it's easier to use a chronograph pusher that you can actuate with your thumb. Now, they've used their own semi-in-house SZ01 caliber rather than the original watch's Le Mans 5100. What has changed? Well, over the base 7750, you have radial seconds and minutes for the chronograph, which means you read the chronograph from the center. Why is that important? Because it makes easy reading at a glance automatic. Now, there's a lot more going on here. The interior of the watch is filled with neutral, or I should say, inert, noble gas, not argon, as the label would suggest, but helium. Now, here's the other thing. There is a copper sulfate tablet in the flank, pardon me, nitrogen, not helium. There's a copper sulfate tablet in the flank that actively removes humidity from the interior of the watch. That is a big, big deal because it is replaceable and it actively dehumidifies the watch. It's not enough to hope it was sealed up at your watchmakers, not after years in service. It's better to have layers of insurance. You've got the gas on the inside, you've got the double seals, and you've got the copper sulfate. Now, if you look at the case back, you'll note no display case back here. Zinn is honest about what's inside. It's a 7750 tuned and re-engineered by Zinn. But 20 bar water resistance means that whether you're actually a German customs agent or just a desk diver, this is one that's ready for just about any adventure you have in mind. Compared to the 40 millimeter original, this one is 43. And I absolutely adore the way it sits on my wrist. A big watch that wears small. Zinn is all about utility. And you can tell your friends you found the mythical German sports watch. Yes, they do exist. All right. Question right here, Amro, about the Line Sport Mono Pusher. I gotcha. Another sports watch from an entirely different corner of the world, geographically not really that far away, but an entirely different mindset from Geneva comes possibly the chronograph of 2018. It's the F.P. Journe Line Sport Monopoussoir Rattrapant, a timepiece, 44 millimeters in diameter and 12 millimeters thick. It st sticks to F.P. Journe's ethic of keeping his watches relatively slim. Now, let me be perfectly honest. This is a controversial watch with a rather dramatic neck down between the bracelet width, the integrated lugs, and the case profile. It's a timepiece that you love or hate with no one left neutral. What everyone does love, however, is the caliber, caliber 1518, the movement itself is made of solid gold and it is over 40 millimeters or 18 French lean in diameter. You can see everything, the levers, the horns, the two column wheels, the free sprung balance. It has an 80 hour power reserve and you'll note 18 karat rose gold on the inside 18 karat rose gold on the outside. The dial is a glorious dark coloration with twin registers fixed by blued screws in the F.P. Journe style. You'll also note that there are biomorphic rose gold hands and applied rose gold Arabic numerals on the dial. This is a watch that also features a date reprising the F.P. Journe chronograph with a date for the first time since the Octa Chrono bowed out in 2007. Now, this watch does replace the Santograph, so if you want to buy one new, you're just about out 
out of luck. This is what's replacing it in titanium, platinum, and rose gold. I may as well fire up this 80-hour reserve and show you that for which FP Journe has been working since 2015. FP Journe movements, by the way, 15, 18. 15 is the year he started work, 2015. 18 is the size in French lean. Now let's see it in action. Okay. It is a split-second mono pusher. You can operate it conventionally like a mono pusher. So the trigger at 2 o'clock starts it, stops it, and resets it. Now, when you start it and you press the trigger at 4 o'clock, you activate the split functionality. So you can split the time and you can gauge the gap between two concurrent race cars, runners around a track, boats across a course. It has that functionality. But remember, it's a mono pusher, so once you stop it, you do have to reset it. Tachymeter scale, rubber bumpers to protect the case, and you'll note throughout a blasted rose gold finish, not satin, not polished. This is going to be a controversial choice like the design of the watch, but FP Journe, not afraid to break a few eggs and offend a few collectors. He makes what he likes and he likes what he makes. The one name on the dial, the only name on the watch, is the only vote that matters at Montre Jaune. All right. I opened with a Patek Nautilus born of the 70s. I'm going to end with an Omega Seamaster born of the 60s. That's right. I have a true Omega Seamaster 300, a 165024 on the table tonight. Now you can see this one is a survivor. The bracelet is stamped first quarter of 1968, and this is a 165024 with a caliber 552 25 joule, or excuse me, 24 joule high grade automatic Omega manufacturer movement. If you open the case up, and you can see that the case back has its original hippocampus imprint intact, and the Omega bracelet, the reference 1039, is correct. Original bracelet, case back, Nyad crown, dial, and even the original. Thermoplastic bezel. This is a survivor. This isn't a time capsule piece. It's not a museum piece. What this is is a daily driver that has survived the ravages of time, hard use, the life of a sports watch born to be abused, and it's made it to the modern era more or less as it left BOBN back in the 1960s. This watch is 40.5 millimeters, so it wears like a modern watch on the wrist, and the bracelet, despite its age, vintage to 1968, still has all of its original manufacturing tolerances and metal. As you can see, very little of this watch has been refinished, which means all of the original stainless steel is still present and correct. This is a gorgeous watch, and I'm going to oblige you with a wrist shot, because my career in luxury watches started with Omega. I've got a soft spot for the brand, and this episode is going to end with Omega. Okay. Omega Seamaster. From the mid-60s, I can imagine wearing this thing for a dive on the wreck of the Andrea Doria off my native Long Island. A monster, still a monster, in 2018. Over 50 years young, it's the Omega Seamaster 165024. Guys, thank you so much for joining me tonight. I want to thank everyone who tuned in, especially you guys who got up early in Singapore and you guys who stayed up late in Africa, the Middle East, and Europe. I really appreciate all my viewers around the world. I'm Tim. This is Watchbox Reviews. This is Watches Live. They're the crew. I'm thankful to you. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.